Just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm so privileged to be a part of this church family and the staff. Um, just uh, get the, the honor of being asked to, to preach in this great series on grace. Um, week one, uh, Pastor Darrell kicked off this year, and he defined grace as something we cannot attain through hard work, willpower, or discipline. Grace is not about performance. It's about receiving. And he spoke out of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And he broke down that text as is with four points. And he challenged us and encouraged us in the year 2016 and throughout the rest of our lives that walking in grace is just based off of the four things that are in that verse. Last week, Pastor Fred continued our series. And he challenged us to change the way of our thinking that grace is something more than just what we say before a meal. That grace is a party invitation. And he used the acronym of grace, that God's invitation to reconciliation and adoption to celebrate eternity. Today, I would like to talk about walking in grace and continue this series. I heard a story about these two hunters who were walking through a forest looking for deer. And when all of a sudden a giant bear, uh, bear jumps out and scares them half to death, they dropped their guns and ran the other way. One of the hunters stopped, opened up his backpack, and laced up a pair of running shoes. His buddy looked at him and said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You can't outrun a bear. And to the, this hunter said, I know, but all I have to do is outrun you. <laughs> It was Forrest Gump, the great Forrest Gump, who said, you can tell a lot by a person about their shoes, where they go, where they've been. So what does your shoes say about you? Maybe your shoes say, I am dressed for success. Maybe your shoes say, I'm on my feet all day long. Maybe your shoes say, I'm just trying to make a fashion statement. Or maybe your shoes say, I could run forever. If you know me, and if you don't know me, you're going to get to know me a little bit better today. I, I kind of like shoes. Um, I've brought just a few of what I have today to show you. Um, there's something about shoes. I feel really good when I put on a brand new pair of shoes. I mean, I believe I could do anything. I believe I could fly. I believe, you know, it's all about the shoes, right? But it's interesting because shoes to me are just more than comfort. They have sentimental value. I have stories of when I've worn these shoes. This particular shoe over here, and trust me, I won't go through every shoe for the sake of time. <laughs> but this shoe, this shoe is 22 years old older than any of the young people I minister to on Wednesday night. So they, they're like, now they really know I'm ancient. And you would think that my, that my freshman year of basketball, this is the shoe I wore, you would think my team colors were red, right? No, no, they were purple. So these really went really well um, with my, my team. But this shoe, when I wore this shoe, it really, I was in a season of my life where I was growing. And and I met my high school basketball coaches who impacted my life greatly. I met my best friend who I'm still friends with today. There's a lot, a lot was going on when I was in those shoes. But as much as I like my shoes, and I know what they say about me, I know that I need to occasionally step into yours. I think every time we walk in each other's shoes, we become a little bit more like Jesus every time. 
When we start to understand and empathize with each other, our capacity to love expands and we become more patient with each other, more peaceful with each other. We become kinder, more gentle, more faithful, more tactful. And how we treat others changes and we become less judgmental. So today I would like us to step into someone else's shoes. Someone who encountered Jesus. Someone like us, but with different backgrounds. Different styles of shoes. Someone who was real, with real issues, real struggles, real doubts, real hopes, and real dreams. I think as we walk through this message today, pun intended, we will be captivated by the way Jesus meets people right where they are. The way that Jesus puts himself in other people's shoes. The way he loves them, encourages them, challenges them, and the way he sees deep inside and speaks right into their heart. And hopefully after this service, we will walk away changed. Today we are going to slip into a pair of flip-flops. How many of you are flip-flop wearers, lovers, of, right? A few of you? I brought my flip-flops, just had to wrap it, it's the least I could do. I brought the rest of my shoes, so. <laughs> but most people who wear flip-flops are simple, outdoor-loving, free-spirited types. And that describes the person we will talk about today. He is known as John the Baptist. He, like Jesus, died when he was in his 30s, and he was cruelly executed by a politician. There isn't a whole lot written about John the Baptist in the Bible, but I believe that prior to the arrival of Jesus, this long-haired, locust-eaten, camel-skin, flip-flop-wearing desert guy was the greatest man who ever lived. Now, I know his resume is not that impressive as other people in the Bible. He never conquered kingdoms, administered justice, shut mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, or even overcame enemy armies. He certainly did not look the part of typical greatness. But I believe that apart from Jesus himself, John was the greatest man who ever lived. Maybe some of you that know the Bible well may disagree with me and say, well, what about Abraham? What about Moses? What about David? What about Elijah? All those people are really good candidates, but I'm convinced that John the Baptist was the greatest. In fact, I'm really positive about it. Look at what Jesus said about John the Baptist in Luke chapter 7, verse 28. It says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no greater than John. See, I told you so. <clears throat> but what was it about John that he would receive that much praise from Jesus? What does it take to live a great life? Who and what defines greatness? How do you become great in Jesus' eyes? Well, let's slip our feet into John's flip-flops and find out. Today I want to talk about five things that we need to do to be walking in grace. And I'm going to take a you know, little note out of Pastor Fred's playbook and give you another acronym of grace. Number one, gifting. Using your talents. John was God's limited edition. Another pair of shoes that I own are these. A little bit newer than the last. These are limited edition. Do you know how I know? There's only 12 of these made in this entire world. Do you know how I know that? I designed them. I did. No, I didn't make the shoe. Nike did that for me. And I kind of based it off of the shoe that I wore 22 years ago, so it looks very similar. And I made this shoe, and it was generously donated to 
me and the, the team that I coached that year, the greatest basketball team I've ever coached. But there's something about a limited edition, right? Well, one of the qualities that Jesus loved about John was he was just trying to be who God created him to be and nobody else. He embraced his originality. He was comfortable in his own shoes, in his own skin, and he saw himself not in a prideful or rebellious way, but as one of a kind. And John was a very unique and gifted character in so many ways, starting with his birth. When the angel came to his father in Luke 1, verse 13, it says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never heard of a Baptist who was filled with the Spirit even before he was born. But that's a whole other theological discussion to talk about later. Verse 16. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord, their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Have you ever thought about how many significant Bible characters had unusual births? Of course, there was Jesus, born of a virgin and delivered in a stinky stable. There was Moses, almost murdered at birth, but escaped by being put in a basket and floated down a river. There was Isaac and Samson and Samuel, all who were born to women who struggled for many years with infertility. And that was pretty much John's story. He was born to parents who were way too old to have kids. I mean, they were basically buying pampers with their social security checks. <laughs> their names were Zechariah and Elizabeth. They had given hope of ever having a child until one day they got a message from God. An answer to their prayers in Luke 1, 18. It says, Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I am an old man, and my wife is also well in years, about 39 or so. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Basically, Zechariah's response is like, no way. Angel, I don't care what you, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm old. We've been praying. My wife, we, we can't have kids. And Gabriel responds, God said this is going to happen, so you will just have to keep your mouth shut literally and wait and see. So John had a pretty unique birth. But then again, so did you, right? Now, I don't know where you were born. I don't know what the circumstances were. Whether you were born in a hospital or a home, in a bathtub, on a boat, in the back of a taxi. But your birth was unusual too. In fact, it's unlike anyone else's because you are unlike anyone else. David wrote this in Psalm 139 verse 13. He says, you made all the delicate innermost parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Basically, David is saying, I am one of a kind, limited edition. Did you know that God delights in watching you be you? He loves you. He loves your eyes, your nose, your lips, your hair, or the lack thereof. He loves your acne, your wrinkles, your bulging biceps, your love handles. He loves you. His workmanship is marvelous. There is nobody quite like you. Now, we are all in the process of being transformed in the image of Jesus Christ as God works inside of us. But even that flows out of who God designed us uniquely to be. 
I mean, the fruits of the Spirit originates all from one source, and that is God. But the way that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control flows through you is totally different from the way it flows through me. And all of the fruits of the Spirit flow through John differently as well. Jesus said this in Luke 7. After John's disciples left, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds. What kind of man did you go into the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed swayed by every breath of wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, people who wear beautiful clothes and live in luxury are found in palaces. Mark described John the Baptist this way in Mark 1.6. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. He was a different dude. He was a big contrast from the religious leaders of that day. The way he dressed, the way he ate, his hair. He may have even had a few tattoos. Oh, no. A Baptist, especially. And this limited edition was gifted by God's grace, and he had a calling on his life. Mark says this in one word. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and he preached that people should be baptized to show that he had, they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. This was his calling, to prepare the way of the Lord. In other words, to prepare the way for grace. To get things ready, to get hearts prepared for the coming of the Messiah. But here's the thing. You have a calling too. In fact, we all have the same calling. To prepare the way of the Lord. To prepare the way for grace for others. At your school, at your work, in your home, all of us may have the same calling, but all of us have different gifts in how we fulfill that calling. All of us are in different seasons of life, and we all have different doors of opportunity in front of us. Maybe right now the calling on your life primarily is to be a great mom or to be a great dad. God's calling you to prepare the way of the Lord, to prepare the way of grace in your kids' lives. You see, there is only one guy that is called to be Xavier and Kiara's dad. That's me. It is my responsibility to prepare the way of the Lord in my kids' lives. I can't change that. And those who have kids, you've got to know that. That may be the calling that God has for you right now. Some of you have a calling on your life to make a difference at your school or at your work. Maybe take care of a relative or a neighbor or a friend while, while they are ill or in need. Some of you may be sensing a calling on your life to do overseas missions and bring much needed hope in that part of the world. But your calling is to prepare the way of the Lord, to prepare the way for grace. But your gifting is unlike anybody else's. And God has given you these unique gifts so that you can fulfill the calling God has on your life. Now I'm preaching. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Woo! Henry Nowen said, Ministry is the fruit of finding your gifts and offering what you have. Ministry is not something that requires professional credentials, although Christian Life College will help. It is a vocation each of us claims by virtue of our baptism in the body of Christ. Ministry is the overflow of your love for God. Ministry is when two people toast their glasses of wine and something splashes over. Ministry is the extra. 
Be grateful for your unique gifts and your unique opportunities and let the overflow of your love for God splash over the sides of your life. John had this unique ministry and it's centered around one message, to prepare the way of the Lord. To prepare the way for grace. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, For this reason I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you. The message is not always easy to present to this world. But I pray that every time I speak this message of grace, it would comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Because it's all about transformation. And that was John's message as well. See, walking in grace is about your gifting, using your talents for the glory of God to fulfill the calling God has on your life. And through that gifting, number two, you walk in grace through relationships, establishing friendships. I understand that greatness demands to go against the floor of this world, and sometimes you have to say things that are unpopular to say, things that might offend and send criticism your way, maybe even some accusations and slander and very dangerous opposition. Sometimes it gets you in trouble, but I'm telling you, friends, to run from a difficult conversation, to stay silent when injustice abuses the innocent, is not the way of love, and it's not the path of greatness. But I also believe that every time we open up our mouth, it should be filled with grace, and all of us need it. Paul said in Colossians 4, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Season with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. That is relationship. Somebody once told me, Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. But as a pastor, I'm also aware that every time God's truth is spoken, it's going to do something way beyond my control. It's going to land on different people in different ways and touch hearts in all kinds of unique ways. And that's just the power of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. You see, sometimes people don't like something messing with their inner thoughts and desires, and that doesn't surprise me. It wasn't easy for John to speak the truth, but he had to deliver this unique message in his unique ways because he was a one-of-a-kind, limited edition, created by God for his good purposes. And you know what? So are you. When you use your gifts and you build relationships, when you are, when you, are you, God smiles and he knows you are on the path to greatness. He knows you are walking in grace. So we need to walk into grace. We need to establish friendships. We need to have relationships with one another, whether it's inside the church and especially outside the church. And as I was looking through John's life, there was something else great in Jesus' eyes. John knew he wasn't great in his own eyes. You know what I'm talking about? It's number three. It's attitude. And his attitude was being humble. You see, here's the thing. You could take that whole UBU deal and you can turn it into this very self-centered life that says, I'm just being me. That's just the way I am. You just have to live with it. Have you ever heard that before? Have you ever said that before? There's no humility in that. There's no greatness in that. That's not walking in grace. John was humble. He started building a crowd. He had a following, baptizing more and more people that were drawn to him. They were drawn to his message. Some people were known as his disciples. See, John the Baptist, he had stirred up some hope and expectations of the hearts of people. It says in Luke 3, Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon, and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. 
so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. In other words, I'm not worthy to even walk in his shoes. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. People who are great in Jesus' eyes, they always look to go low and lift high. They are lousy self-promoters. Their attitudes are like Christ. When people are trying to put the spotlight on John, he always says something like this in John 3. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the best man is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are, the, we are of the earth, and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. And then one day in John 1, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and say, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. John says, basically, I'm the warm-up act. He's the main event. He's the headliner. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the highest. He is the greatest. He is the Lord of all. Angels worship him. Nations will bow down to him. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Basically, he's saying there, is, there he is, grace in the flesh. John the Baptist said in the... John 3.30, the King James Version said this way, He must increase, but I must decrease. Friends, if you want to live a great life, if you want to walk in grace, your attitude should be, He must increase, and we must decrease. You say, well, okay, Pastor Dan, why are you pressing this whole attitude and humility thing? If you are tired of hearing about attitude and humility, then you probably still need to hear about it. And if you just got mad, then you just proved my point. <laughs> you see, Jesus talked about it, and he demonstrated it all the time. He said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first, and the greatest among you must become servants. And then he went to a cross and to show us this whole, how this whole thing works. He said, this is the path to a great life. This is the path to grace. These are the shoes you need to wear. You go low and lift high. John said, he must increase, and we must decrease. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. How often... Is our witness and the very message of the gospel determine more of our attitude than our words? See, if we want to walk in grace, it's about our attitude and it's being humble. It's about lifting him up because he is the one that gave us grace in the first place. Number four, walking in grace is about confidence. It's this blessed assurance that we have. See, John was confident. He was a tell-it-like-it-is kind of a guy. He knew his calling. He knew his gifting. He built relationships. He knew his attitude. He was comfortable in his own skin. He did whatever God asked him to do. He recognized the Lamb of God when he saw him coming. He even heard the voice of God when Jesus was baptized. This is my son whom I am well pleased. Man, can you imagine that? He heard it. He was there. He was on the scene. And yet, having experienced all these things, he even wrestled with doubt at times. When you have doubts, fears, anxiety, pain, anger, frustration, confusion, you can still be confident. You say, well, God, I know you have a plan for me, but why do you allow things to happen the way you do? Have you ever been there? And I've said that more times than I could count. God, why do you allow these things? God, I know your word says 
that you cause everything to work together for good for those who love, love you, right? But God, I, tr I trust you, but cancer sucks. God, I trust you, but dementia, man, it's, it's, it's rough. I trust you, but loneliness, I just can't handle it. I know you love me, God, but I'm scared. Have you ever been there? I'm there more often than I should be. God, can you reassure me? Listen, be confident that his grace is sufficient for you. Right? That's what we need. We need God's grace in our life every day. We're going to have doubts. We're going to have fears. But be confident. Have that blessed assurance. Because God loves you and God's got your back. And that leads to my final point. There's no getting away from it. Walking in grace is about eternal life. Living beyond yourself. Last week, Pastor Fred, that was his E, eternity. But you just can't get away from it. Because that's what it's all about. Living for eternity. When life gets tough, and it does, and it will for all of us, great people, or what I like to refer as grace people, they stand strong, knowing eternity is theirs. That's why John the Baptist was willing to live such a passionate life for God. He knew dying for God was worth living for. If Jesus was willing to come from heaven to earth to die for him and make a way for him and give him the grace he didn't deserve, there was no holding back. And I'm confident that if we interview John the Baptist right now, he would do it all again in a heartbeat. But here's the thing, folks. The final chapter of John the Baptist's life was a soap opera. And I don't even have time to get into the details. But it was all about tangled relationships, lustful passions, drunken decisions, political intrigue, unsolved guilt. Who was this long-haired, locust-eating, camel-skin, flip-flop-wearing desert guy? Who does this guy think he was? And because he stood for the truth, and because he fulfilled the calling that God had in his life, he was executed for it. He was killed. What a tragic and senseless end to a good man's life, or at least it appears. But you need to understand that when John's disciples went to get his body to bury him, they didn't get John. See, he already slipped out of his flip-flops and into eternal life. You see, when you live for God and walk in his grace every day, when you trust God with everything, when you know that the cross and the empty tomb has prepared the way for you to live forever, there is no lo you are no longer afraid of death. And when you no longer fear death, you no longer fear life. Jesus said in Matthew 5, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things about, against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it, he says. Be very glad for the great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted too in the same way. Walking in grace, bottom line. It's about eternal life. Oh, maybe you've heard it said, maybe it's a cliche. It isn't. It's what it's about. It's living beyond yourself. You see, whether it is Nicodemus' wingtips, the Samaritan woman's stilettos, the centurion's soldier's work boots, the woman caught in adultery slippers, or the bare feet of the disciples, whatever shoes you wear or whatever shoes you need to step into, all of us need his grace. And grace is not just for the person who grew up in church either. Oh, that was a good one. That was a good one. See, Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us approach then God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive and find grace to help us in our time of need. Can I challenge you this morning 
to use your life to prepare the way of the Lord? To use your life to prepare the way for grace? Be God's one-of-a-kind limited edition, always looking for ways for God to increase and you to decrease. Build such a great relationship with God and then stand strong like John and live your life for eternity. And when all is said and done, somebody might just look at your life and say, now there is a pair of shoes I'd like to walk in. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And I pray right now that your word just continues to penetrate in our hearts and in our minds right now and today and tomorrow, this week and this month. God, I pray that you will help us walk in your grace every day, that our life will reflect what you have done for us and what you continue to do for us. God, I pray that you will help us. Give us the opportunity to use our gifting for the glory of your name. And through that gifting, may we establish relationships with each other. God, help us with our attitude that when the spotlight tends to come on us, may we just go, God, you need to increase. And we need to decrease. God, many of us this morning, we just need to be reassured. We need that confidence. We need that blessed assurance that when the going gets tough, you don't get going. That you will never leave us nor forsake us. God, reassure us that you love us and that you're there for us and that you will continue to be there for us until the end of the age. God, I pray that we will all Open the eyes of our heart that we will live for eternity. That our lives won't, won't be about ourselves and our agenda, even our opinions. But God, every decision we make, everything we do, everywhere we go, it comes down to this. That we are living to spend eternity with you. God, and through that, may your light shine through us and reach others that don't know you. And may they come to know you. God, may they know the shoes that they need to step in. Mm -hmm. And that's walking with you every day of their life. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pastor Amen. Darryl. Amen.